Good afternoon. You can hear me now, right? Okay. Well, so thank you very much for coming here. Um, it sounds like you've got an amazing week of talks ahead. So uh, I'll ease you in with some nice stories. The rest can talk about detailed science and all of that. Uh, but I'm here to talk to you about... Um, an, uh, it, it's a sort of story from a book I've just written, and it came out a few months ago, um, about water. And water is, of course, something that you're all familiar with. I don't need to tell you what it is. You've probably interacted with it multiple times already today. You don't think about it at all. And I wanted to write a book which made people think about water differently and to recognize how strange it is and how, uh, how that strangeness is what causes us to be here and what that strangeness tells us about the rest of the universe. Now, all of those things are things I can't all go, in, go into all of them in one half-an-hour talk, but um, here's one of those threads. So I've titled this talk Water the Strangest Chemical because we think of water as completely mundane and a little bit dull, probably. Um, you know, th there's, there's nothing particularly interesting about it if you, uh, unless, you're a, unless you're a chemist. Um, and if you're a chemist, you're probably terrified of it because it doesn't really follow many of the rules of normal chemistry. <laughs> so in a way, sort of stuck between a rock and a hard place with water. Now, I um, want to tell you what's weird, is weird and strange about it. But I'll, let me come to that in, in a short while. What I want to start with is a journey that I made um, which helped me understand some of these strangenesses and weirdnesses. A journey I made to Antarctica a few years ago. And it was with a scientific research expedition to follow in the footsteps of this man, Douglas Mawson. He is one of the four great Antarctic explorers. Now, you've all heard of Amundsen and Scott and Shackleton, these people who opened up Antarctica for us 100 years ago. He is up there as an equal to those people, Douglas Mawson. He's an Australian-British geologist who organized his own expedition to Antarctica in 1912. He'd been to Antarctica before that with Shackleton. And he wanted to do science down there. The others were more interested in the race to the South Pole. I and mean, they were doing science too, but nowhere near as much as Mawson wanted to do. He uh, organized the trip. He raised money himself and set out in 1912. This is, uh, this is his outfit. Um, it's interesting to know that uh, having... I don't know how many of you have been to Antarctica. It's a very, very obviously very cold place. It doesn't bear thinking about. But even uh, th th this must have been like, well, 100 years ago. And those sorts of natural fibres and things he was wearing. I can't imagine how he stayed warm in that. This was me uh, doing the same thing. Um, this is the coolest picture I could find, by the way. So <laughs> I didn't look that is all the time. But I had ridiculous layers of various technical fibres and things on. But um, anyway, I went to Antarctica to retrace the steps of Douglas Mawson. He had, was taking measurements all through the Southern Ocean as, you, as he went to East Antarctica, a very remote part of the continent. He was taking air temperature, sea temperature, looking at the wildlife, real, ca real serious cataloguing of that part of the world. And we were going down there because the modern, the modern sci climate scientists we wanted to go with wanted to compare that part of the world from 100 years ago to now by taking the same measurements using modern equipment. Um, sea temperature, monitoring wildlife, air temperatures, ice cover, all of those things. Because Douglas Mawson's measurements were so good that you could use them as a baseline from which to compare that part of the world. And of course, in that century since then, we have discovered climate change. We've discovered all sorts of environmental effects of our world. And the scientists I was with wanted to know how, those part, how these effects and climate effects had affected this part of the world, which is, even for Antarctica, it's extremely remote. So we stepped onto a Russian polar vessel, uh, a sort of veteran ship that had been to po both poles many times. Um, and we stepped onto one of these ships, uh, the academic Shakalsky, 2013, December 2013. And, you know, I stepped on with a, a feeling of excitement and a little bit of fear. I mean, I'm not the kind of person who likes really to be uncomfortable. I don't like anywhere that doesn't have Wi-Fi or coffee. I don't like cold places. I don't like wet, windy places. I just like sitting in nice, warm cities, basically. So this was really outside my comfort zone. But immediately onto stepping onto the ship, I realized something was wrong. Now, if you notice on this picture, the horizon 
He's kind of a little bit... Yeah. Um, <laughs> this is a picture we took just a couple of hours into the journey. And, um, yeah, this, this, this ship was rocking back like this for about 10 days. Uh, it was like going 10 or 20 degrees each side. And uh, obviously the sailors who were used to this were very used to it, but the rest of us were just completely sick uh, for the first couple of hours. I remember sort of the moment the anchor sort of came up and this solid ground just started to just move in three dimensions. And I just couldn't quite tell. I couldn't see it moving, of course. But inside, your brain was going, what the hell's going on? It's not used to the fact that the ground is moving as much as it was. And, of course, your primal sort of brain just goes, as soon as it can't work out uh, what's going on with your eyes and your sort of ears, it just tells you to be sick. So within two hours, I was lying on my bunk wishing to get off this ship, but knowing that I couldn't for about four weeks, uh, which was a problem. (laughs) And seasickness is one of these things you can't predict. I mean... Uh, some people who are veteran sailors still get it all the time, and 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 people who have never been on sea, on the sea before are really good at dealing with it and and don't get it at all. I mean, it's very hard to predict what's going to happen. For me, I definitely got sick, and I want to uh, just tell you that the, the the reason the reason this was happening, of course, was that the ship was rocking and all sorts of crazy things were happening. It was really un- uncomfortable. But the, the reason is that the Southern Ocean between New Zealand and Antarctica is the roughest sea in the world. It's um, <clears throat> in, the, in the latitudes that f- you know, go 50, 60 degrees south, there's no land all around the Earth at that latitude south. And so the winds whip up to incredible temper- uh, speeds, rather, and the, the ocean is just this enormous cascade of water which is, you know, wonderful and monumental, but um, has very sort of sickening effects. Now, it wasn't just me that was sick. Most of the ship was. But I want to tell you about Douglas Mawson, because that's where we started this story. He was a prolific diary writer, and his account of his expedition in 1912 to 14, uh, the home of the blizzard is what it's called. You should read it. It's, a, it's gripping. It's lovely stories about what happened there. Also some quite horrifying ones about the kind of conditions. But in the first week of his expedition... Even in the first week of the expedition, the diary is mostly empty because he was laid down with seasickness. And just, just to sort of let you know what kind of man Douglas Mawson was, um, when he got to Antarctica, uh, he sort of split up his teams into groups of three and they would go and map parts of the, con- the continent. They'd never seen, no one had seen these parts of the continent before. And he went into what was eventually called King George V land and he was mapping it and there was a team of three uh, with dogs and sleds. And the idea was to connect up to the land that, that uh, Scott had mapped years before. And uh, there was three of them, and they were going uh, about five, they were about 500 kilometers inland. And there was three of them. He was in, Douglas Mawson was in the middle. Uh, in front of him was uh, Xavier Mertz, a Swiss ski champion. And behind him was Belgrave Ninnis, a, uh, a, an army officer. And they had all their food and equipment, uh, most of their food and equipment on the final sled, and the guy in front was meant to sort of find the crevasses and go around them if necessary. And at one point, he sort of writes in his diary, he notices, this is five weeks into the expedition, he notices the guy in front of him, Xavier Mertz, sort of stopped and turned around, is pointing over his shoulder, so Mawson sort of looks over and can't see Ninnis behind him. So they, they sort of run back, and they see a hole in the ground, and they see uh, a bit of sled at the bottom of a, a crevasse. They hear dogs whining, and they sort of call down to Ninnis, you know, w- w- they call down to this friend of theirs, this friend, a companion, and they can't, for three hours they call down, and they don't hear from him. And so they've lost him. And they're heartbroken, these two. You know, they're, they're completely heartbroken. They're, they're comrades, they're scientists together, they're explorers together. And they decide that they can't continue because all of the best dogs and all of their food is on that sled that's fallen into the, uh, into the crevasse. So there, there's two of them. They've got about a week's worth of food left, and they think, well, we need, and they've got a five-week journey back to, back to the, uh, the coast where their base and their ship is, and so they think, we've got to go back. So they start heading back. Within a week, they've run out of food. Um, they start eating their dogs. Um, and this is a lesson you should learn from Antarctic exploration. Never eat your dogs, because... The livers of dogs contain a lot of vitamin A, and so if you eat a lot of dog liver, you you go create you you go you get very sick. You, uh, and and in fact, Xavier Mertz um, succumbed to that. He was he had lots of ex- seizures. Um, he had a fever, and he eventually died in in Mawson's arms. 
Um, there's nothing he could do about it. Mawson carried on, uh, fell down various crevasses along the way. The first time he fell down one, he sort of got trapped with, um, uh, he, he was carrying his, he was sort of uh, carrying his, um, or oh, pulling his sled along, and the sled sort of got trapped at the top, so he managed to climb out. And so he fashioned himself a sort of wooden frame around him so that when he fell into fer- crevasses and fur- further along, he could climb out. Uh, the soles of his feet, the actual skin on the soles of his feet used to fall off every day, and he would reattach them with lanolin and various things. Um, he, he had very little food, obviously. Um, he, despite all of this, by the way, he still managed to take weather, weather measurements every single day, and uh, that, those measurements he took every single day are still used today as a baseline for a lot of climate research that goes on down there. Anyway, he carried on, and he, he, for about, he knew that he had to get back to his base by the end of January. Otherwise, the ship would have to leave Antarctica for that season. So he was trudging along, and he eventually got to a, a cave, which he knew was only five kilometers from his base. He got to the cave, and they nick- nicknamed this thing Aladdin's Cave, where they used to store food and stuff. And in the, in the cave was like oranges, and there were pineapples there and stuff, so he knew that his comrades hadn't left. And so he was ecstatic at this point. And um, he, he sat there, he ate, you know, opened up these oranges, started to eat them, and then outside, a blizzard struck. And so he was stuck there for five days. He couldn't leave. Um, as a side point, the place where they uh, made their base uh, in Antarctica, Commonwealth Bay, turned out to be the windiest place on Earth. The day that they actually um, they sailed in to Boat Harbour, as they called it, it was completely calm and beautiful. And I remember we went there as part of the expedition, and it is one of the most beautiful alpine-type places if the wind's not blowing, because this is the place where the catabatic winds from Antarctica flow down. So these are winds that flow from the plateau of Antarctica down the mountain and rush across the sea. And the, 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 you can gust up to 300 miles an hour there regularly. Over the two years that they were there, um, the average wind speed was something like 80 miles an hour or something for the two years. So it wasn't a pleasant place. Anyway, the, the, wind, the blizzards are pretty bad. So he, they got stuck there for five days. And eventually he comes down the, the hill, gets to his base. There's people still there. They don't recognize him. You know, he's thin and, and beards are growing and stuff. He comes home only to see smoke on the horizon. His ship has just left. And he has to stay there for another year before he can go home. Now, my point in telling this story is that he is very hard, this man. And even he got seasick. <laughs> now, seasickness is one of these things which, you know, for me was interesting because it was all about how the sea, how this enormous body of water affected me, affected all of us. And if you look from space, the Earth is a water planet. You know, life started in, in the oceans. Um, it produces half of the oxygen in the atmosphere. And in, in all myths, water is the thing that's been there from before the Earth even. Uh, in Genesis, uh, God moves above, above the waters to create the heaven and the Earth. Uh, and in so many cultures, it's about this stuff being used to create the Earth. And being in the middle of all of that, you can believe why people would think these things. The, the sort of scale of it, the tiny ship that we were on, and these enormous waves that were bigger than our ship, tossing us around. You could believe how people came to think how powerful this substance actually is. And in a sense, part of this, this story about water, about its heavenly sort of nature, is completely true. All of the water on this planet, including all the water in you, comes from space. And it wasn't there at the beginning of the earth. Now, to understand where all of that water comes from, you know, we have to go right back to the beginning of the universe to understand where the ingredients come from. So, 13 point, cast your mind back, 13.7 billion years, if you can. The universe explodes into being in the Big Bang. And in the first three minutes, not much happens because it's so intense and the energy's a bit too crazy for anything to actually form. But after three minutes, all of the hydrogen in the universe is there. The hydrogen is formed after three minutes. And for a long time after that, not much happens. For hundreds of thousands of years, it's just hydrogen. But this hydrogen isn't spread equally. It's clumpy. And at the clumps, it comes together with gravitational attraction, 
and you form stars. And the first generation of stars forms. And these stars are pretty huge, and they burn through the hydrogen very quickly. At the, at the center of these stars, the hydrogen fuses into helium, it releases some energy, and that's how the star shines. And eventually, when there's not enough hydrogen left in the center, the star will collapse and die. And as it collapses and dies, the outer layers explode into, usually, if it's big enough, a supernova. And these are some of the brightest explosions in the universe. We still see them today. They can be brighter than the galaxies that, they, uh, that they're in, usually. And th when these uh, explosions happen, they create, um, again, they create some of the most beautiful objects that we see in space. Um, this is the Helix Nebula, 700 light years away, and it's two and a half light years across. And this is the kind of thing you create when a star explodes. You create this enormous cloud of materials that have been fused together at the, in the center of the star. And that's how a lot of the complex elements from, you know, everything from oxygen to, well, helium, oxygen, carbon, nitrogen, all these things are formed in the center of these stars and they're distributed through the galaxy through these explosions. Um, this is the Rosette Galaxy. It's 5,000 light years away, 50 light years across. And this is probably one of the most famous ones, the Pillars of Creation. 7,000 light years away and four light years across. And those clouds are full of elements. They're, they're, they're nurseries for planets. They're the nurseries for new stars as well because there's still lots of hydrogen in here. And our sun was created in one of these sorts of nebulae about four, four and a half billion years ago when the first generation of stars had exploded and seeded space with all these elements, um, the, the hydrogen that was left in these, these clouds ended up coming together again, forming new stars. And our sun was one of those. And as it came together, the rest of the gas and dust and stuff around it would circulate around it to form planets. And remember, hydrogen's already there. The other element in, ox in water, oxygen, is also there. It's been formed in the center of these stars, and it's floating around in space outside. So how does that form the water that we, cr we know of today. Well, the story that's emerged over the last few years is quite interesting. What happens is that as our sun was forming, there were just an infinite number of tiny, tiny grains of carbon and silicon, tiny nanometer-sized grains floating through the, through the space around it. And they, they sort of circulated, they were just minding their own business. Occasionally, a hydrogen atom would hit one of these things and bounce off. Occasionally, an oxygen atom would hit it and bounce off. Very occasionally, a hydrogen atom would, would sort of bounce onto one of these grains and stick to it at the same time as a, an oxygen atom. This is a really rare event. And whenever those rare events happened, an oxygen and a hydrogen atom randomly bounced onto one of these carbon or silicon grains, they would fuse, and you got a molecule of water. And that's how every single one of our molecules was created. Over hundreds of thousands of years, each one of these little grains got covered in a little carapace of ice. And these little ice grains just floated through space. Eventually, they attracted each other and would form stones and then rocks and then boulders. And eventually, these boulders came to form planets. And all of our water was there in place. When the Earth formed, however, from these sorts of grains... It, you can say, right, there was a lot of water there already. But because it was so hot on the surface, a lot of it evaporated away. And so the, our surface of our planet, about four billion years ago, when it was very new, was completely dry. So the question is, where did all the water come from? Well, the leftover grains, the leftover rocks and comets and asteroids and things that didn't become planets, which were sort of out in the farthest reach of the solar system, at some point, something disturbed them. And a shower of them came towards the inner solar system, hitting all of the planets for about half a billion years, just colliding with the Earth, Mars, Mercury. All these planets were just completely inundated with asteroids and comets, which contained this water that we see here. And our oceans arrived 500 million years after the planet was formed from these asteroids, from these comets. Now, which one of those was the major source? Still to be determined. But they would, roughly speaking, that was, the, that was the source of our water. Now, as you carry on towards Antarctica, um, the temperature of the water gets lower and lower, and 
you eventually start to see ice on the surface. You see ice on the surface. This is the first um, bit of ice we saw about 10 days in. This is just sea ice, which is uh, maybe a metre or so thick, two metres thick, and it's the remnants of the previous year's winter. The Antarctica, of course, uh, every winter doubles in size as the sea freezes. Then in the summer, Antarctic summer, it melts, and the water, it sort of, the, the ice floats off into the Southern Ocean to melt. And we see this. And it kind of calms the waves a lot, so there's less rocking around. Um, and these, the, the, these, these, these ice flows are, are beautiful things in themselves. In, um, uh, you start to see amazing colours. And Antarctica is a place which, I don't know if how many of you be, have been, if you have been, it's an incredibly white place for obvious reasons because of all the ice. But then when the colours do come out for a couple of hours every sort of sunset t- sort of time because the sun doesn't really go down, the colours are outstanding in their oranges and their golds, and all that colour is just sort of fused into one part of the day. Um, and you begin to see all sorts of colours in the white. I mean, I don't know if it's just me going crazy, but the white was, wasn't just white. As, as the temperature of the sea uh, gets colder and colder every day, uh, eventually you start to see icebergs, of course. And these things are, again, things you've seen on documentaries and in films and in, in books. And uh, this picture is one well, taken by my colleague who's a photographer, but even that doesn't really do justice to what these things are in real life. These behemoths, this was 50 metres tall, dwarfed our ship, uh, but hundreds of metres below the surface. You know, uh, shapes that just defy existence. This thing had probably existed for thousands of years. These are pieces of Antarctica that had snapped off the glaciers and moved into the sea. And again, they're melting slowly as they go into the Southern Ocean. But what was salutary about this was that this thing has existed for probably longer than most of human civilization um, because the glaciers on Antarctica were created by snowfall over tens of thousands of years and then eventually they migrate out and snap off. And over a few more hundred years it will disappear. You can see, I mean, of course, these, these things are... Um, you can do an entire talk just on icebergs in terms of how beautiful they are but I just wanted to look at one thing, which is just behind that sort of triangular-shaped thing there, the, the sort of light that comes out from inside icebergs as light sort of comes in and it gets refracted around and then bounces out. It's as if there's, an ele- there's like lights and electric lights underneath these things. Um, as, well, but as, 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 as remarkable as it is, though, that this is tens of thousands of years old and as beautiful as it is, the one thing that I think struck me the most, which you're very used to, is probably more weird than all those things. Is that this is this is this that it floats? You know, this is an iceberg that floats. Well, all icebergs float. Of course they do. Ice floats. That's what we know that. But it is just a really strange thing if you think about it. You know, solids shouldn't float on the liquids. But we're so conditioned to think that that's normal that we don't think about it at all too much. And the reason that. Ice floats, of course, is due to its chemistry, due to the fact that uh, you know, when ice, when water freezes, it, the, the molecules get further apart than they are in the liquid, and it's less dense, and so it floats. But if ice didn't float, life wouldn't exist on this planet. I mean, that's just... It, it sounds like a very profound thing to say, but if you think about it, over the history of the, um, the Earth, we've had many, many times when the temperature has been too low for water to, to remain liquid... And so the, the whole surface of the Earth freezes. And the oceans freeze, all lakes freeze, everything freezes. And we've had these ice ages, of course. And if in that time water froze like a normal thing from the bottom up, oceans and things would freeze from the bottom up, and every single life form that was created um, at any point would just have died and would have to start again the next time round. There wasn't an ice age. So there wasn't, there wouldn't have been a continuous period for four three billion years for life to have evolved into the complex things that we see today. Also, as it happens, uh, if as water freezes at the top, it insulates the water underneath. So it always remains, always remains above freezing point. So about four degrees Celsius at the bottom of lakes and all sorts of places. So there's always been somewhere, thanks to the chemistry of water, for life to evolve continuously. Now, the, these are just, the, 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 this is just one of the weird chemistry, chemistries of water. Uh, it, it, to understand all of that would take us a little bit too long, and maybe if you're interested, I can go into some more of them later. Um, but the one more I'll go into is 
the, the, re- the reason that water is useful for life, the reason that we find it, that it's, it's sort of become this medium for life, is not only that, as I've just said, it's created the conditions for life, but if you look at this picture, this story, this also tells you a little story about why, it's, why water is important for life. This is a water strider, and it's sitting on a uh, surface of a pond. And you can see that it's not sinking underneath because the surface tension of water is very high, and we're sort of used to this generally. Um, uh, th- th- this thing's evolved to be like this, of course, but uh, water molecules like to stick to each other more than almost anything else. They don't like to stick to anything else as much as they like to stick to each other, which means that for something like this, water strider, an insect, it, it forms kind of an impenetrable well, Let's just call it an impenetrable barrier. And this water's stickiness, water's bonding to itself, is kind of the root of many of the functions that it has within our cells. And I'll leave that chemistry bit just there. Now, we know that human bodies are two-thirds water. We know that um, hydrogen bonds... Uh, we know, sorry, we know that human bodies are two-thirds water... We know that we need to drink water. It's in all our foods and all those things. But it's the hydrogen bonds. It's the, it's the ability for this thing to stick to itself that allows that stuff to function within you. It helps electricity to move between, in and out of cells. It moves energy around. It moves nutrients around. And it does it all because of these abilities it has to stick to itself. As you move along Antarctica, though, you, you know, it's kind of hard to think that anything could live in a place like this. In a, in a, if water is associated with life, and it is, then when you get to sort of the plateaus and things, you see things like this, and it's devoid of anything. It's a very strange place in that there isn't any green for a start, um, which is weird if you've lived, <laughs> if you live anywhere else, of course. Um, but despite, despite the fact that this is the very antithesis of life, that with the temperature and the, the winds and, and all of that, life does survive here. It survives wherever there is the chance of liquid water. So the very first things we saw, of course, were penguins. Uh, this is, these are Adelie penguins that we saw as soon as we landed on Antarctica. These things are very in, were very interested in us for about five minutes before being not interested in us for the next three weeks. Um, um, anyway, they, they, they survive. They survive because they, these guys eat krill um, at the, uh, in the ocean at this, point, at this stage. Um, and, you know, these, they're, they're absolutely, <laughs> absolutely glorious. I'm just going to go through more penguin pictures now. Um, the, the, the other things that live here, of course, on the, on the coast uh, include seals. This is the Weddell seal. Um, this was having a bit of a rest that morning after hunting all evening. Uh, we managed to get a little bit closer. Uh, quite cute. Um, and if you want to see another penguin, there it is. Um, my point here is that despite the lack of conditions and things. Life does exist on this, on this place. And it's not just mammals and, uh, and, and birds that live here, complex life, but wherever there is liquid water in a place as extreme as this and other extreme places, places that are dry or acidic or incredibly hot or whatever, places where you think life couldn't exist, as long as there is liquid water, because of the reasons I've told you, because there, wherever there's liquid water, there is life. And on the flip side to that, wherever there isn't liquid water, you don't find life. And it's not just on this planet, then, that makes, that makes it interesting. If we find life in these places, in Antarctica, in the dry valleys, or in the Atacama Desert, where it hasn't rained for hundreds of years, or at the bottom of the ocean, where it's near hot springs, it's 400 degrees Celsius, which doesn't make sense for anything to live down there. And we do find organ- organisms... We find organisms that can manage to survive in these extreme places as long as there's a little bit of water. Then it gives us hope that there might be life elsewhere too. Perhaps, perhaps in space, in environments that we would have originally thought would be too extreme. So beyond the solar system, we've been looking for worlds just like our own, exoplanets that have liquid water on them. And the whole history of space exploration in the last 30 or 40 years years has really been a search for liquid water in different places. And, you know, we, we've, we, found, we, find, we found about, there's about 2,000 confirmed exoplanets now and many thousands more candidates, and we'll find hundreds of thousands more. There's probably trillions in our galaxy alone. Um, this is a picture of 
Enceladus. And you can see, this is one of the moons of Saturn, and you can see these little wisps, and they are geysers of water discovered only recently uh, when these, the Cassini spaceship, this is a spacecraft, sort of flew through them almost by accident. Uh, that means, and the, the discovery is that this is a, a, a moon that's covered in several kilometers of ice, and over, underneath that there is a liquid ocean, a hot liquid ocean, sitting on what they think is rock. Why is that interesting? Well, it's because that is exactly the condition, in a manner of speaking, that the Earth was in th three and a half billion years ago before life was started here. If we're to assume that life started at the bottom of the ocean, which is one of the prevailing theories, uh, uh, hydrothermal vents at the bottom of the ocean, what we're talking about is hot water, minerals, all the conditions are there for life. So there is a real excitement about the idea that conditions like this might also have created microbes or something over there. And there are missions planned on places like this, and Europa, one of the moons of Jupiter, which has a similar sort of geology. We know there's liquid oceans there too, of liquid water. These oceans have only been discovered in the past couple of decades. In the next couple of decades, we'll probably go and visit them, might even sample them. And of course, once you realize that these things exist in our own solar system, we know that there must be liquid uh, water in other parts of the uh, galaxy too. And what I find interesting about it is that we found planet after planet that is more and more Earth-like, that might have water on it. And water then becomes not only this thing that we take for granted that's part of all our goods and has some strange properties and things that create life, but this is probably our connection to alien life if it does exist. If life exists somewhere in space, it's probably using water as its medium to do all the things that we do with water. It will probably use a different thing to communicate its information, to, it won't, a different thing to DNA to communicate its information through generations. It might well use different proteins if it uses proteins at all. But the one thing it will have to make all those things work is water, because water is the only thing that can do all the things that you need for life to function, to make DNA work properly, to make proteins work properly, to shuffle energy in and out of cells, to create cell membranes, all of that stuff. I think that's what I find most fascinating about this, which is that at the smallest levels, water makes us function, makes our world function. I've not even gone into the sort of politics of water or water resource. That's as important as the rest of it. But that this is our connection to the rest of the universe. Never mind the fact that also it's the second most common molecule in the universe too. So if you think of a liquid, if I ask you just to think of a liquid, you're most likely going to think of water. And if you think of something else, whether it's beer or apple juice or whatever else, or blood, that's mainly just water with stuff in it. There isn't a liquid you can probably think of that isn't water. I mean, it's so familiar that it's mundane, and every day we drink with it, we wash with it, uh, we boil it, we freeze it, we do all sorts of things. And what I think is kind of something we take for granted a little bit is that we only, so, we only sort of see these things because we live in a world where the temperature and the pressure and the conditions on the surface allow us to see all these edges to that substance. And I suppose it's really interesting to us because we're made from it. I think it's most interesting that the stuff that we're made from is a complete mystery to us. Thanks. <laughs> have you got... I think we might have a little bit of time for questions before we have to go back upstairs. If anyone has any questions. Yes. Right. You're asking about the research vessel traps in the ice. That was us. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so if you didn't hear this story, but uh, our expedition, December 2013, it was meant to last four weeks. It lasted eight uh, because, <laughs> because we got trapped just off East Antarctica um, uh, in the ice. Um, that's, it's kind of a different story in its own respect. And um, if you're very interested in it, you can read all about it on, on the Guardian website when I was writing from there. But in summary... Uh, yeah, we got trapped because we had finished our expedition. Um, we'd, been to the, we'd been to Mawson's Huts, which was one of the goals. I'd done a lot of scientific expedition, scientific measurements. And as we were leaving East Antarctica, 
The winds change that day. And wind, again, those of you who've been to the poles know well that in these extreme parts of the world, your life is completely constrained by the weather. Um, I mean, I'm from England, so it is anyway. But, um, it's, uh, but, but anyway, it, it really is uh, constrained by the weather. And you, you may be able to travel one kilometer that way uh, if you've got to travel one kilometer in your ship to I don't know, some waypoint over there. It's probably easy to do that in 10 minutes if, you, if, if everything's okay. But also it might take you a week to do the same thing, depending on the weather. And it, it's just very impossible to tell until you're there and you're monitoring these weather charts and things. And so what they say is, uh, what the captains have to tell us was, that you never have plans in Antarctica, you just have hopes um, uh, mediated by the weather. Uh, and so what, that's what you do, you've got to be very calm about it. So one day we were, we were about to start heading back towards New Zealand and the weather changed overnight. And if you imagine Antarctica here, the ship was here, Australia's sort of up here somewhere, we needed to go back, New Zealand rather, and the wind started to blow this way, and all of the pack ice I showed you, the sort of floating remnants of the winter, which are blown around by the wind, blown around all Antarctica, and they move at a few knots every day. If you imagine Antarctica, the ship, the wind blowing this way, all of the pack ice was blown this way, and it's incredibly powerful stuff. It sort of forced us, it sort of pinned us against the continent, and um, we were just stuck there. And there's no way any ship could have got out of that. In fact, we thought initially we could get out of it because it wasn't too thick. But as the wind kept blowing, it sort of piled up on itself. And it's incredibly difficult to find leads through that. You needed quite a serious icebreaker to get out. So the story is that um, we had two icebreakers come to try, three, come to try and get us out. None of them could get there. One of them got stuck eventually itself. So we had to be rescued by helicopter. Uh, and uh, which was exciting, uh, and so um, that's another that's another whole thing about you know uh, uh, w the, the speed of how this quickly this happened was quite incredible. The first day when, they, when we got stuck, we saw open ocean about two kilometres away. You could see it, and the next day it was twenty kilometres away. That's how much ice had turned up, and you, you you can't do anything about that. And the reason we were rescued because normally this happens all the time. Um, Shackleton famously got trapped in the ice. Everyone gets trapped in the ice, uh, and you just wait for the winds to change and you can get out again. But the reason we couldn't wait was because there were icebergs in the distance, and icebergs don't move with the wind. They, they move with the water currents because they're so deep. And so they can move through this pack ice as if it wasn't there. So we were stuck. We couldn't shift, whereas the icebergs would just come anywhere. And these things are enormous, and they can just like literally consume entire ships. And so uh, uh, the decision was made that we had to be taken away before this happened. Fortunately, the icebergs went the other way, so we were okay. Um, in the end, we got rescued, and we went to the Australian icebreaker, which is at the edge of the ice pack ice, 20 kilometers away. It took us three weeks to sail home, um, by which time the academic Schakowsky, the wind had changed, and the academic Schakowsky got home before us in the end anyway. But, you know, it, it, adds, it, adds, it adds another story to tell the grandkids. <laughs> uh, we actually made a film of the, of the rescue. If you want to see it on the Guardian website, if you go to... I can't remember what it's called, uh, but, but um, there's a film we made which is basically getting onto the helicopter and seeing the ice from the, uh, up there, seeing the sort of 20 kilometers worth of ice and just seeing how this thing can really control your entire life. And again, another example of just the, the scale of the water, the scale of the environment, which I think for any city person like me, always worth seeing that once in your life to show you that you're not in charge of everything. Yeah, please. Right, so what you're asking about water refugees and the availability of water in the future. It's an incredibly important subject uh, and one that's been written about by a lot of people um, very well. I didn't include a huge amount of it in my own work only because I felt like it was... I didn't want it to just be a chapter in a book about something else. I wanted there to be something more um, sort of timeless about it. But the most important thing, yes, right now is water resource. And one th what I'll say about that is climate change... Um, is changing water availability around the world. I mean, 1% uh, of the world's water is available for our use. Um, so 97% of the world's water is salty. Another 2% is locked up in the ice caps, and 1% is available for us to use, which is actually doesn't sound like a lot, but it's actually plenty. It's plenty for us to use, and it all gets recycled anyway. And we do waste a lot of it, of course, but that's a, another issue. Um, but... Um, um, 
with climate change, what's happening is that, is that some places are getting wetter, some places are getting drier, and they're not necessarily correlating with people, where people live or where food is grown. So this is going to cause a lot of displacement of people. So yes, that is the pressure. It's not that we're going to run out of water, but it's going to be available to different people who maybe don't need it as much and probably will find it annoying that their houses are getting flooded all the time. And then there's going to be huge amounts of the tropics, for example, where water won't exist. It won't be there anymore. So that's that's the sort of overall picture of it. But um, if there are climate scientists here who can add to that, then please do speak up. But that 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 displacement of people is the manifestation of the change in water resource because we've always built our cities around water. We built our cities around and settlements and civilizations have all built around rivers, coastlines. Easy access to water is important for a civilization. So it's just natural that as the water shifts around. You know, the people will shift around, and that's going to cause pressure, of course, because cities can't just move, unfortunately. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, maybe one more question, if there is one, and then otherwise, I think we should probably head up. No? Okay. Well, thank you very much for listening. Um.